All right, what's up fam? Welcome back to the channel. Now, as y'all know, I'm stationed stateside here in Florida as an airman. But to give you guys what life is like overseas or how to get stationed overseas, any types of questions like that, I have some of my close friends, some of my buddies with me that are gonna tell you about what that is like, as in how to get over there, what it's like, what daily life is like living overseas as an airman, all right? So be sure to stay tuned. We got a great show for you guys today. And of course, make sure you like, subscribe, you know, drop any comments, any love, any questions that y'all have that we can answer for y'all, man. Let's just keep this channel growing. I appreciate y'all, and we'll see you in there. Peace. All right, fam, welcome back to the channel. And as I let y'all know in my intro, I had some of my brothers with me. Uh, we all met in tech school. And so there's those of y'all that have been DMing me about what comm tech school is like, we all went through that struggle. But as y'all know, I am stationed overseas. So I have some of my friends here with me to tell you what it's like to be stationed overseas as an airman. So why don't y'all go ahead and introduce yourselves, guys. Right, go well, first, uh, go first, brother. I'm Airman Spencer. Um, I'm a radio troop. Uh, my first assignment straight out of tech school was at um, Kadena Air Base located in Okinawa, Japan. All right, all right. My name is uh, Airman Cabrera, and I am currently stationed here at uh, in England um, at Mildenhall. Uh, well, yeah, Mildenhall is about two hours uh, away from, you know, train ride, well, two hours driving away from London, one hour away from uh, London by uh, train, and about 45 minutes from Cambridge. So if you kind of figure out, that's how close I am to London and all that. I say the best for last. I'm Airman Wilson. I'm stationed right here in the Herbert Field. That's my first assignment. And uh, I'm not as cool as these guys because they got to go overseas, but, you know, I'm right here at home. So, right. you know, I'm pretty sure Esther can explain exactly what he's going through. I'm in Florida with him. So, you know, it's kind of the same thing a little bit. So me and Wilson are actually stationed both in the Florida area. So we just wanted to compare stateside airmen versus an overseas airman, you know? And we've been chopping it up a bit, different school on us. We all have the same job, but <laughs> different, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, we different can different missions. You said what? Different missions. Oh, for different sure, missions. So we'll get into And you know what? Sometimes you don't even know what your mission is. Okay, I'm gonna tell y'all that right now because <laughs> You know, <laughs> it took me about three months to figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. But uh, first question is, why did you want to get stationed overseas? What was your why? You know, was it adventure? Was it this? Was it that? What was your reason to want an elite adventure? Whoever wants to answer first. Uh, you want to go first, Cabrera? Yeah, yeah, I'll let it rip. So uh, I'm a ginormous soccer fan, and my team plays here in England. And... I just put it out there in the universe to 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 get me here, um, and I got lucky that my second choice overall uh, came through, which was England. Both my first and second, first, second, third, fourth were all England, and I got here, um, and I'm loving every minute of it. Uh, I I love it here in England. I'm even my wife and I are even thinking about living here after it's all said and done. Uh, huh. yeah, brother. It's, oh, it's, it's dope. like that, huh? Okay. Yeah, it's okay. dope, man. Chelsea, uh, Chelsea. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why I, I truly, honestly wanted to come here. Uh, it's for that, and then also to see Europe, uh, to see England, and, and to go to the places that that you know that I can't go to do the things that I can't do in this area. So that's why I wanted to come. Uh, well, for me, uh, I've always wanted to travel. You know, I didn't have a lot of opportunities to uh, even leave my home state, let alone leave the country growing up. So uh, I just figured if uh, I was going to be in the military, going to be in the Air Force, um, I would just try to shoot and see if I could go to a place that I would love to go. Um, Japan was high on my list, actually. I think the first two bases I listed we're in Tokyo and here in Okinawa. Uh, Japan, you know, is like one of the world's greatest countries, you know, not that any countries are not, you know, right. places you want to be, but this is definitely higher up on my list. 
So I just uh, shot for it. Always wanted to come to Japan. I wanted to go to England too, but they sent me here. That's really why I decided to go. It's just great to explore, experience new cultures, uh, learn a whole nother language. I'm actually picking up Japanese. So it's cool. Oh, Meet Japanese okay, women for okay, one thing too. too. So okay. it's, all, it's all very interesting being <laughs> over here. All right. Yeah, I think that's the biggest thing we'll get from this. But uh, Wilson, why did you decide to stay stay? I'll go, I'll go too, but why did you decide to stay stateside? First of all, I'm telling you right now, I didn't. Okay. <laughs> sometimes, like, sometimes the universe is on your side, right? <laughs> I chose I chose all Europe and then I chose Japan as well. You know what? I'm not gonna complain because Florida's amazing. I love Florida, but hey. you know, I did choose to go overseas as well. You know, I wanted to, I wanted I wanted to go to Germany. I want to go to Ramstein, you know, go over Europe with the boys, but you know, at the end of the day, it, Florida's beautiful, man. Herbert Field's a great, great assignment, so I can't complain. All right. Okay, I feel yeah. yeah. I said for myself, I had to make a decision. I had Ramstein and some and Lake and Heath on my on my dream sheet, but then I was like, you know, either I know I'm gonna get stationed overseas or I know I'm gonna stay stateside. And honestly, like, I guess I just wasn't ready for that major of a life change. My goals were just, you know, get my money right, get my school right. I wasn't mm -hmm. that. Do I wish I went overseas sometimes? Like, yeah. But uh, yeah, I knew I had family in Florida. So like, at the time, those were my priorities. I mean, you're in Tampa, Florida. So, you know, it doesn't get any better than that. Florida, right? <laughs> Going out. I'm in Tampa, Florida. So, you know. All right. So, talking about dream sheets, we mentioned them a bit. How can somebody guarantee themselves an overseas base? Because that, that process is a little tricky for some folks. So, for y'all that got overseas, how would y'all guarantee somebody get that base that they want overseas? Um, well, I'll say this. If you want a guarantee on where you'll be, you should get rid of that uh, expectation right now. The military is going to send you wherever they need you, first and foremost. But there are ways to play the system. Um, what I did to come here to Japan was speak to a few people I knew who actually had been in the Air Force or, and people who were actually already um, in the Air Force and had spent time in. Your dream sheet is what it sounds like, the dream places you would like to go to. Mm -hmm. um, they give you eight selections for the stateside and eight selections overseas. You have a higher chance of actually going overseas if you leave the stateside blank. That's true. That's, That's the one key that's thing the, yeah. that people don't know. If you don't actually put anything there, they don't have any stateside basis to even start with for your dream state, uh, dream sheet. <clears throat> Secondly, this is also very important. You want to choose bases that actually have a, um, a long term um, uh, assignment. You'll also want to choose bases that have a very short term uh, assignment because it's just about manning. If you have a short-term assignment, the, the, the flow of airmen coming in and out of that base is very high. So they're always mm -hmm. gonna need somebody to replace someone who's leaving. That makes sense. If you have a long-term assignment, like the one I'm at right now, which is three years, they're gonna wanna um, send you there because they're prioritizing having airmen go there to actually learn their job because it's usually a special mission. Right. right. That's what I know about um, getting overseas. So, Kavir, you got the top uh, based on your list. Do you have anything to add? Yeah, so I actually, I heard the same thing, but I did the opposite when it comes to filling out stateside and overseas. And it was, I, I specifically remember a conversation. I don't remember exactly with who, but it was like, why on earth would you put yourself up there with, uh, for the algorithm to choose for you? So I filled out both sides. However, everything else after that, um, I did the same and I started even before I got in. So for example, like I, I, with our job, we can go anywhere in the planet. So right. it's a little bit the, like the, the, the possibilities are endless, but like, for example, you have a, you are a maintainer. You want to, your, your job is to work on a specific jet. Uh, I got the F-22 or whatever, whatever the case me, or I work on nukes or whatever, or you're a RPA sensor, which is a drone operator. Mm -hmm. There's a limited amount of bases, so there's no point on putting, you know, I want to go to, I don't know, whatever base there is on the planet, and your job doesn't exist there. So you got to do your research as a civilian on 
have an idea that because as a civilian, before you get in, that's when you have all the power. You have all the power to choose your to to manipulate the system to choose your job, and in that you can choose where you want to go. So if you want to be, let's say, a drone operator, a drone operator only works at like six bases overall. Well, you got to know that. Okay, I only want to work six bases. I can only go to six bases overall. What bases do I put top to bottom? Where do I rank them? And you like, okay, I want to live. Let's say they have a base in I don't know New York City. And that's the spot that you want to go to. You want to go to New York City. You do not want to go to, let's say, Los Angeles, right? Well, there's no point on, on uh, like, you put on your list, number one, New York City. Number, the lowest one, Los Angeles. And that tells the algorithm or that helps or puts in your favor uh, in the algorithm to get you to the spots. Because at the end of the day, they don't care where you go. You're just a no in that regard. You're just a number. You're just a skill set. And so you just helping yourself out by telling the system, "Hey, look, if you're gonna send me somewhere, these are the spots that I want you to send me, or could you send me to the spots?" And you you do that, and you you, you increase your chances. And then is after that is just luck, luck of the draw, luck of the draw. Now, does anybody want to mention um, by putting South Korea? on your basic preference, like oh, being your first yeah. star? Because I know that if you put South Korea, like number one, there's a chance that you might get it. And once you get South Korea, then you get a basic preference after you yeah. there for, you're there assigned it for a year. So yeah. I don't really know the, the ins and outs of it, but I just know that, right? Is that the case? I don't know if yeah. you want to explain that a little more. Yeah. Better. Yeah. So like, so what is it like base of preference or BOP? So let's say you're from a hometown somewhere. I don't know where. Hometown is let's use New York City, and you're like, yo, I want to get stationed in New York City, New York City. There's only one way to guarantee or massively increase your odds of getting New York City, and that's if you do one year in Korea. There's certain jobs, um, or I should say certain bases that uh, uh, give you base of preference. There's only certain times, and I think I think being an MTI gives you base of preference, uh, I certain think, special duties do give you a certain basic preference. special duties, oh, oh, okay. but and then certain special duties on also certain bases. And Korea is one of them. You go to Korea, you will get a base of preference after, and you'll know it. So you'll know it. You'll you'll get your assignment. Boom, you're going to Korea, and then your follow-on orders say, boom, you're going to New York City or wherever your hometown is, and you can game the system like that. But without putting, see, I never put Korea. Cause I have a family, so I can't go to Korea. Um, as a first term airman, you cannot go to Korea. You cannot go to uh, Korea. Might be the only spots, but let's just say it isn't. I think you it's also Turkey. To... I think also too. But I'm yeah, not sure. Turkey. Yeah, Insulik Air Base in Turkey. Insulik yeah, Air Base. Yeah. Uh, Insulik Air Base, Korea. There's one in um, Dubai. I can't remember the name. Yeah, there's a few bases. Or Abu Dhabi. And all of it. All this stuff is out there. All of this information is out there. You just have to hustle to find it. But there are certain places that if you have a family, that if uh, you cannot go as a first-term airman. So um, I didn't even put, like, for me, that, that wasn't even an option. So I didn't even put it on there. Um, and after that, that's pretty much it, man. Like, one thing I will have to say with this whole Air Force thing is that it, for whatever reason, it, I feel okay knowing that everybody – get screwed equally when it comes to certain situations like there's no like guy in the sky that you, somebody has a has an email to like whatever like there's no there's no phone you can call to but like plead your case like everybody gets screwed equally um and, and that i don't know why that makes me feel good like it's fair you know everybody's getting everybody's getting getting bent over the same i don't know why that makes you feel good like i don't i don't that's a whole military thing, man. We all go through this together. The good, the highs, and the lows. But um, I don't know if y'all saw base of preference. That's a big thing. Did y'all get that email as well that starting June 1st, they're actually taking that away? Yep. Well, they're taking wow. it away for wow. almost everyone except your first-term airmen. So if you, you really? know, okay. extend a few years, you'll still be able to keep it. But, yeah, yeah it's going away. But they're going to replace it with something that they say will be just as good. But we'll have to see what that is. Um, All right. So that's for anybody that's looking to come in, that is still an option for first term airmen. I don't know if you have to already be enlisted or not, but I wouldn't yeah. accept for that for sure. Yeah. All right. Let's go on to the next question. 
Yeah, we already covered a bit about what a short tour, short tour versus a long tour is, right? Pretty much you stay there for at least one year or minimum of a year, and then you'll go on to somewhere else. So I'll move on to the next question. What did you guys have to do to prepare to come overseas compared to a stateside? And whether it was the paperwork that you had to fill out in tech school or what you had to do, you know, training wise to be over there, what was that difference like for y'all? Uh, you want to go first, Converter, since I saw it the yeah. last time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, for me, again, I have a family. It was a completely different situation from, from Spencer's. So, my situation is, I'll break, I, like, I can be here all day with this, so I'm going to break it down easy, easy. So, you have, if you're bringing, well, if you're bringing your spouse, they have to get medically cleared to come, to go wherever they got to go. Then they have to get their passports. That process alone is three months so as soon as you get your orders you gotta hustle to have them done if not then it's gonna be a waiting game uh so that right there is three months between the two combined then when you come when you leave your tech school yeah they set up a date for them to come and kill it uh collect all your household goods and have it get it ready to ship if you have a car that you're shipping the same thing they um you get you get hooked up with the company and you start the emails back and forth on having your car shipped over. Then once you get all of that, you get your tickets. Uh, that could be a process in and itself because I was told that I could not fly with my wife and my kid together on the same plane if I didn't ship a car. Um, who knows if that's true or not, uh, if that's just something that they just said, that that person was misinformed, but let's just say that they were not misinformed. That's another process. Then once you once you uh once you get you know the day of your flight comes, pack up as much stuff as you want um to carry your bags. I know for us, we have we we were able to take there's a, a, a there's an amount of bags that you could take and with no weight limit if I'm if I'm not mistaken, on how much you can load up on the plane. So we had twelve bags. And I'm talking like 12 green duffel bags. You no, know, we had like eight green duffel bags and like you know four suitcases at the airport. And it was like a, it was a circus watching us come through the airport with all that stuff. Um, and then you get here, and then it goes from there. You get a sponsor. You start working with your sponsor before, and that's that's Air Force period. Anytime you're gonna switch over to a new base, you're gonna PCS to a new base. You're gonna get a sponsor, and they help to smooth the transition from one base to another. So the process is a process. Sometimes it goes easy. Sometimes it goes, it's much harder. But the point is, it's a process. And you just got to just gotta play the game. And, and I will say this, like, before I got into the Air Force, I used to like, ah, whatever. It's not a big deal. It's not a big deal. Um, it, it, you know, I'll get to it when I get to it. Now being in, like, it's not, I, can't, I, I jump on things. ASAP. And the reason being is that the wheels behind the scenes takes forever. The gears grind to, to go forever, whether it's, That's a fact. oh, I'm only going to be, oh, we got in at 7.30, 8 o'clock, and lunch is at 10.30. Bro, what is that? That's like, <laughs> we're only working for two hours. And then we go come back from lunch, and then I got to check all my emails, and that takes till 2. And then, up. Oh, 3.30, I'm out. That takes them too. Why does that take <laughs> Bro, like, oh, okay, bro, but, I not, see. but you know, you know how people are. Oh, shit. What is going on? What is going on today? Oh, okay. Uh, so you know how it is. You know how people in the military are. So, like, that's why you need to jump on things ASAP. So that's, that's, uh, that was my preparation. Okay. Well, um, for me, uh, I'm a single dude, so preparation wasn't all that difficult. All I had to do was make sure that I was uh, cleared to go medically, and that was it. So going out of uh, tech school, uh, I, I, I actually immediately left. I went straight from tech school to Japan. So I left tech school, graduated. A week later, my flight was, uh, my, my flight was a week later, and I was in Japan two days in two days. So the physical preparation was not that big of a deal. Um, what I do wish though that I did um, prepare myself for was um, mentally. I didn't really consider uh, 
how far away Japan actually is from America and what uh, might actually go on uh, in the world while you're away. Um, I do miss my family. Uh, there have been events that, you know, have happened that I wish I was there for, that I wish I could have uh, actually taken um, some time to be with them. But because it's I'm just too far away, you can't be there for, for people. So I would say if you're a single person in my position and you're only responsible for yourself, it's not going to be that difficult. Save your money to make sure that when you come here, you can buy all the appropriate things. You can go travel. You can see everything you want to see. Uh, take any. It's your um, passport. Yeah, get your passport, get your, um, just just save money so that you'll be prepared to actually be on the other side of the planet and experience a new culture. You know, there are a lot of different opportunities out here in Japan, but some of them cost money. Even flying from Okinawa to uh, Japan isn't that costly, but if you're going to be on the mainland, you're going to have to spend money on an Airbnb, this, that, and the third. So it just it's just about actually saving your money, but you'll want to prepare yourself emotionally and mentally because a lot of people come over here thinking they're going to be... Uh, able to just adapt instantly and japan is starkly different from being america being in in america i should say um there are a lot of cultural differences and a lot of people aren't able to make the adjustment there are actually some troop in my shop who don't necessarily dislike japan but dislike the fact that everything is so different that even little things get to them like going to the grocery store and being able to ask somebody for something and they can't do that here because they haven't really made the uh or at least had successful attempts to adapt to what it's like living here in japan so i'd say mentally prepare yourself if you're in my position just a single person single young adult try to mentally prepare yourself about what's going to be different more than physically so that is a, an effort that you got to make to adapt to that culture that language all those little things you might not think about huh? yeah it's a huge effort i mean even even speaking to japanese people they're very um I would say introverted, or at least more introverted than Americans are. So you, it's harder to make friends with people in Japan, um, especially if, if you're not a you know Japanese. They're just they're a lot more re reserved than us. So okay. you have to take more time. Especially New Yorkers, put, right? Yeah, well, that's, that's also very true. <laughs> that's that, yeah, that's also very true. So they're just very they're very reserved. So you have to take a lot of time and like. To slow down your pace of uh of like um relationship building because they're just they're just more reserved than us and did you have to end up catching a rotator out of there to tech school or how did you yeah um <clears throat> so leaving tech school was pretty simple um they're gonna the military is gonna pay for you to go to your next base all right so no matter what you'll have a, a plane ticket over there for me i left immediately after tech school um you'll have to do what they call out processing uh, it's a long, lengthy, ridiculously complicated process that they have in the military. Anybody you meet from a colonel all the way down to an airman will tell you that it's, it's a tough process and it's got to be fixed. Everybody gets screwed equally. There you go. That's exactly what he mentioned earlier. So it's a little bit tough um, out processing, uh, especially at Keesler. If you become a, a cyber troop like we are, um, you'll have, to, you know, it's a little bit uh, interesting to out process from there. But you just go down this long list of things that you have to do to get out, medical stuff, uh, making sure you've graduated, et cetera, et cetera, making sure that your room is cleaned up and uh, appropriate for the next airman that's going to come at the tech school dorm that you'll have. So <clears throat> you'll go to TMO. They're the ones in charge of actually um, getting you a ticket. So you'll go to them. They'll give you a ticket. It'll have a date on it as to when you're supposed to arrive at the airport. Um, if you want to take leave to go see your family before you actually depart the country, uh, the date will be set after your leave date ends. So you could take a week, two weeks, a month, or however much time you have um, to take after tech school. And then you'll have a flight. You'll catch your flight from wherever your hometown is or from near your tech school. After that, you'll go all the way to Seattle. At least the rotator is going to Asia, fly out of Seattle. Um, it's a military um, flight, but it's actually a commercial aircraft that they're using. So it's a really big jet full of just people in the military and contractors. Um, flying from Seattle all the way to Japan, it was a lengthy ride, but it wasn't really that difficult for me to get through it. Uh, I slept half of it and the other half, I just read a book. 
So if you have like an iPad, you can save movies or download your favorite books and read those. Um, also at TMO, ask if they have any uh, seats near the window, if that's what you're interested in, because sometimes they'll allow you to actually get a seat like that. I did, and I was able to take pictures of Mount St. Helens, Salt Lake City, uh, this beautiful part of Japan called Iwakuni. There's actually a Marine Air Station there that's like one of the most gorgeous places I've ever seen in my life. Um, so yeah, the flight the flight is long, but it's not that bad. Um, yeah, and then you'll land at whatever base you're gonna go to. If you come to Japan, you might land here in Okinawa. Right, and I think the biggest thing for anybody going overseas is to start that out process and as early as you can with your tech school, man. That's the biggest thing, I think. But uh, Wilson, we stateside. What what do we have to do to leave to leave? Texas? Um, all we gotta do is drive, man. All you gotta do is drive. <laughs> And as a matter of fact, they pay you for that as well. So, you know, it's crazy. There's some people that actually put extra weight on their car because I think the Air Force pays you based on how much your vehicle or something weighs, so how much weight you bring or something like that. You want to explain better, Esther? Do you know about that? So I didn't. I actually flew straight from Keys there to, uh, to McDill. Oh, uh, okay. My car, but I have heard that they'll go off of the weight of your car and then they pay you uh, a certain amount of cents per dollar for every gallon that you drive so most people might still make their money back if you're moving a lot of stuff from like a house to a house then yeah you'll definitely have to deal with the weighing with whatever you haul that you have and stuff like that but the process isn't too difficult i didn't take leaving route did you take leave in route no i did not take any leave i went straight over there so it's yeah, I, I, can't, I came straight to florida so it wasn't it wasn't nothing okay yeah, yeah pretty you know. simple stuff yeah i took shit i oh I wasn't supposed to carry. I took a month, uh, a month uh, before I got here. I took rap. That's a huge, a huge thing. If you anybody doesn't know, anybody at any point in your career could take rap. You can only do it once a year, but that's twelve free. Uh, what did I say? Vacation days, uh, but it's definitely twelve extra days of leave um, in your hometown. So, I took rap. Um, and I'm, when I go back again, I'm taking the rap again. Um, I'm going to do it again and I'm going to keep doing it until I get out of the air force every year. You want to explain, explain what a uh, rap is real quick? Yeah. yeah I don't so know if you're rap, before in other videos or not. Yeah. Yeah. But... yeah so rap real quick is a recruiter assistance program. Look at your boy. Uh, the recruiter's assistance program is basically you go back to your recruiting office and you help out your recruiter for 12 days. So it's five and five and they just count the weekend as part of the 12 days. Um, some people have to actually work. Uh, some people actually have to work during their rap and some people, you know, the recruiters like, hey man, I know why you're here. You're just here for the, for the leave. You know, come in in the morning real quick and then have the rest of the day off. It all depends. Um, I had to actually work uh, on mine, but my recruiter was super cool and super chill about it. So it wasn't, you know, and that's another thing too. Like, I, I know all of us, we all had jobs. We came into it, into the military with life experience uh, yeah. before we got in. When people say work, it's not like, so it's not like you have your retail job and you're actually on or a warehouse job and you're actually hustling for, you know, eight hour shift, like nonstop, nonstop, like military work. I should say when you're in garrison and garrison means you're at home station. That's, that's just, they can't, you know, once again, the military, but military work in actual real life. Uh, if you come from a hard labor trade or something like that is two different things when you're home station i can't speak when you're out and i can't speak for all afscs like maintainers you know boy they got it hard <laughs> compared to how we got it they got it tough man the security forces they got it tough no matter where they're at yeah, so for everybody for the last week yeah for this exercise you're an augmentee uh-huh, armed up and everything. It's rough. I'm oh, my God. That. I am so sorry, brother. I'm so sorry. Okay. Um, hey, hold on, hold on, hold on. I'm lost here. I'm lost. What, what are you talking about? What did you just say, Esther? 
I was on Augment T. So pretty much uh, like when there's an exercise or when something's happening around the base and they need more people, they'll, they'll pick other guys from different squadrons. And then you'll end up going through CADM again for M4 and M9. You do like police training, you could say, so that when they need you, they call you up. So we had an exercise not too long ago and I got called up to participate because I had that training and they needed more bodies. Oh, well, if it's just an exercise, but if it's just like we had our section chief, he told us the other day. So he came in right shortly after 9-11 and the whole country, every base, they were like, yo, like tensions were high. Nobody, they were trying to figure out what's up. He was an augmentee for 18 months. Oh, yeah. we, we, 18 months uh, with security forces and they had him doing all the training everything and he was like bro like I, I i'm a i'm a cyber troop like I, I don't do this like i don't need to do all of this like sorry brother you're doing it all and uh yeah so not i mean spencer i don't see a future like that for us i don't, I don't think also, they ever also, gonna um, for that. when it comes to rapids you don't have to just um go to your hometown recruiter you can obviously go to any um like any city you want to as well so if you want to take a vacation to anywhere you want to go 12 days you know you can go to any recruiter call any recruiter there's been guys that actually called like recruiters in hawaii and been went to hawaii for rap is uh not rap what's it called for rap right yeah right um, as well yeah for rap so i mean you gotta get airbnb of course no one's gonna pay for the flight but if you really you know if you want to go out of your way and do that then you can too so yeah yeah you can go anywhere any base My neighborhood, so like the that's mil- so a military, uh, the two houses for, on the for our viewers out there. What was your first touchdown in Japan and then the UK? Like uh, Chinese Japanese style paintings right. where they draw the mountains and stuff. It actually looks like that. 